let me thank our audience for attending this, today's session and for uh, joining us in, in the discussion today uh, in the topic Africa. Okay, so uh, this session is being done, as, as Beatriz already mentioned, uh, in partnership with, uh, with Nova Africa, which is uh, the knowledge center to which I am uh, associated with. And Nova Africa was uh, created in 2011 and uh, by the Nova School of Business and Economics of Universidade Nova de Lisboa. And its mission is to produce uh, knowledge with uh, an impact on business and economic development uh, in Africa. And since its creation, Nova Africa has been using uh, pioneering social experimentation methodologies uh, with data collection uh, on the ground with real proximity to, to the communities. And this has been the key feature of the work that we do, uh, the work that we develop. And um, it is really in this way that we think that it's possible to access the impact of measures and, and policies to be implemented in order to be able to reduce poverty, promote social integration and provide equal opportunities for all. And this, is, this methodology is called randomized controlled trials. And it is this experimental approach that has uh, to alleviate global poverty that has won Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo and Michael Kramer, um, the Nobel Prize in 2019 in economic uh, sciences. Uh, we of course have other activities um, besides our uh, research projects, which is, uh, which is the, the main thing that we do. Uh, they are related uh, to um, uh, knowledge dissemination, uh, such as conferences as well, and seminars and podcasts. So really anything that allows for the dissemination of, of the knowledge that is being created in the field. So we are even more thankful to be able to, to be here today in this part, uh, which is the dissemination and the conversation of, uh, of, of, of different entities discussing, uh, discussing a topic. Um, let me tell you a little bit of, of what's the plan for, for today's uh, uh, conference, okay? So uh, we will first hear uh, three different talks that have been prepared by our, by our panelists. And throughout the talks, please feel free to write down questions that you might have to uh, that you might have to each of the, the presenters. Uh, I will collect them, and uh, when we open for discussions at the end of the when at the end of the, the three talks, uh, we will go through these questions. And of course, at that moment, please feel free to please feel free to ask more questions and to uh, and we'll try to have a little bit more of an interactive uh, session. And um, we have here, so, um, so let me start by, by presenting each of the panelists that we have for, for today. So first we have uh, Inez Vilela. So she's a lecturer in economics at Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, she's a researcher also affiliated with North Africa. She holds a PhD in economics and her work focuses on development economics, specifically in political economy and, and, and social networks. And the topic for her talk today is security, terrorism and humanitarian interventions. And particularly interesting is uh, Inez is currently working on civil conflict in, in Northern Mozambique. She's studying the determinants to join armed conflict related with Muslim radicalization and how different policies can reduce early stages radicalization. This is a very uh, uh, topical research avenue and it will certainly be very interesting to, to hear uh, in your talk. Um, following, we will have Professor uh, Elisio Makam. Uh, he's an assistant professor of African studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland and a research, of, a research fellow at the Centro de Estudos Internacionais Instituto Universitário de Lisboa in Portugal. He holds a PhD and habilitation in sociology uh, uh, from the University of Bayreuth. And he has previously taught development sociology at the University of Bayreuth, where he was the founding member of the Bayreuth International Graduate School of African Studies. Um, he is among other things, a visiting lecturer at Universidad de uh, Eduard Montlén in Mozambique. Uh, he regularly offers methodological workshops to Portuguese-speaking African doctoral students on behalf 
uh, of Council for Development of Social Sciences Research in Africa. Uh, the topic for uh, Professor Elise's talk today will be threats to democracy and the effects of COVID-19. Uh, as we know, COVID-19 has not been an even, even, even experience for um, uh, across different nations, uh, specifically when compared more and less developed nations. So it will be very interesting to, to hear Professor Elise's talks. And uh, finally, we will have uh, um, José Francisco Pavia. So he's a professor at uh, Universidade de Luzia de Lisbon, uh, where he's an associate professor uh, in the graduate courses of international relations, security, defense policies, international economics and foreign trade, among many, many others. Uh, he's the coordinator uh, of the specialization course in international politics and the editor of the journal Luzia de International Politics and Security. Um, he was the director of Luzia de Research Center for International Policies and Security between 2013 and 2020. And uh, his current work has focused on the study of subjects related to security and defense, including Portuguese foreign policy and the participation of military forces uh, in peacekeeping operations. He is the author of the paper Multi Track Diplomacy in the Presentation Resolution of African Conflicts, the Successful Case of Mozambique, which is a very appropriate uh, study in such an interdisciplinary panel that we have here today. Uh, and the topic for his talk will be on multilateralism and uh, international organizations. And I won't take uh, any more, more time. I will uh, go directly into uh, our speakers for today. Um, and so, yes, without further ado, I'll just ask Inesh to, to start her talk. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mathilde, for, for the kind uh, presentation. Thank, thank you, Beatrice, and, uh, and everyone uh, for, for the invitation. So let me just start by sharing my screen. Let me... So can you see it? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so the topic for my talk here uh, is uh, security of terrorism and humanitarian intervention. Uh, and, and first of all, let me tell you that I was very happy for, for the choice of the topic. Uh, since terrorism is a phenomenon that uh, well, mostly we associate it with, uh, with the Middle East, but in recent years, more and more um, a conflict event related with terrorism started appearing or researched uh, in, uh, in, in the African uh, continent. So here I have, uh, so as a, as a broad motivation with, with numbers, which is uh, so my, my, my area of, of expertise, let's put it like this. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, deaths uh, from terrorism uh, in 2017, so this is the, the recent, uh, so the more recent map that we have, and these show us that although the, the terrorism deaths are, are mostly occurring uh, in uh, Middle East uh, countries, uh, more recently uh, there, there's been uh, some uh, countries in, in the African continent which also have been uh, seeing this uh, sharp increase uh, in, in deaths by, by terrorist attacks. And if we go uh, even further in time, and if we look at uh, some um, data from last year in terms of which are the, the countries in the world with higher risk uh, from, from terrorism, we see that in the top 10, now seven of these countries are actually in, in the African continent. So it seems that uh, terrorism is something that uh, much more and more uh, African countries have to, to deal with uh, and especially some of them for, for some of these countries this is a, a relatively new uh, uh, phenomena and, and governments and, and the population is not uh, well uh, prepared uh, to, to deal with this. So if we look here, uh, so this is uh, an evaluation of risk done by Mapplecroft uh, last year, and what we can find is that uh, countries as, as Mozambique and DRC Congo are now in the highest, so this is a little bit uh, weird, maybe. So zero, closer to zero means higher uh, risk from, from, from terrorism. Uh, and um, 
Mozambique and Congo are now closer to this uh, to this top level uh, of risk. But of course, then we also have some more traditional countries uh, in terms of uh, of an history with, uh, with with terrorism, like for example, uh, uh, Kenya, which also presents a continuation of high high risk. So it seems that uh, for sure terrorism is something uh, that uh, African countries have to think about, and uh, of course that these kind of almost a migration from uh, Middle East countries to towards some regions uh, in Africa where um, these groups find uh, a mix of, of, goods, uh, of a good environment to prosper it with uh, low poverty, a uh, low quality of uh, local institutions and also the existence of, of, of uh, large uh, natural resources, it seems to be that something that uh, both national countries and international organizations now have to deal with. Uh, so the big question here is how do we address this and how do we fight uh, this? And I'm, I'm not going to propose anything, uh, anything new. So uh, what we know in terms of uh, different uh, formulas to attack this issue is first in terms of military intervention. Uh, so of course, this is uh, mostly a security um, 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 problem and it has to be dealt with professional, uh, professionalized uh, uh, military intervention. Uh, then, of course, and if we look in terms of the short term um, effects that we need to deal with, uh, with displaced uh, people and, and poverty, of course, we also have to consider uh, humanitarian intervention uh, for mostly for, for victims, uh, direct and, and indirect. And then uh, we have to think, or we could think about different ways to address these issues in terms of the long run, and especially if we want to look. Uh, not only of how to fight it uh, immediately, but also if we want to address um, sometimes the, 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 the reasons behind uh, this, this terrorism uh, phenomenon. And this is what we call uh, the types of uh, development interventions and hearts and minds approaches uh, to deal with terrorism. And here we can think about of different uh, types of interventions where the objective is actually to increase um, to increase um, living conditions of, of, the, of the communities and to make sure that people have a job, people have uh, education. Uh, so this idea that it's not only about the short term, we also have to think about the long term and provide um, conditions for people uh, to to, to improve their living conditions. So, so that's the idea. And what I'm going to tell you more today is actually about this development type of interventions. Um, and um, especially because uh, from what we can see in the literature, this seems to be a very important uh, piece in this puzzle on how to address uh, terrorism and uh, similar types of, of conflicts. And which sometimes it, it's hard to be forgotten uh, when we only look at the, the, the short term need to solve uh, to solve conflicts. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what we know in terms um, in terms of uh, how these hearts and minds approach uh, work. Uh, so first, uh, the idea here uh, is that um, countries and governments use, use this type of development uh, interventions in order to gain support from the population. So you have to think about this as a way that, okay, so if, if the population uh, has, a, a, has a job, if their kids are in school, if they have uh, access to good public services, then uh, it's more likely that uh, they will be happy and uh, they will support the government and, not, uh, and they will not support uh, some, some, some type of, of people that will uh, try to, to create problems. Okay, so that's the idea, and we have a lot of evidence in the literature, mostly in terms of uh, US interventions, that these type of uh, development programs have positive effects uh, in terms of support for the government and uh, low, uh, lower um, conflicts in these areas. But not all, all, the, all the literature on this and not all the evidence that we have on these, uh, on, on these development uh, interventions in terms of increasing 
uh, support from the population are good. So there's some examples, in particular in uh, Philippines and also uh, in Afghanistan, that show us that after some, some types of uh, development uh, interventions, actually there is a, a backlash. Uh, so this backlash happens especially when uh, the types of development uh, programs that are uh, put into place are easily um, are easily um, appropriated by terrorists. So if you think so, uh, if we think about some um, some development intervention that is, they are easily appropriated. For example, you provide goods uh, or provides uh, some machinery or things that are easily uh, changing and. Uh, transported somewhere else, then we actually, in these, in these examples, we actually see a rise in conflict in these areas that receive these uh, goods. So overall, uh, it seems that we have to be careful on how we design these development interventions that aim to reduce uh, terrorism and conflict. And it seems that this first type of interventions that look at, for example, uh, improving infrastructure, improving things that are very hardly appropriated, seem to have a higher uh, positive impact uh, than something that is uh, easily stolen, let's put it like this. Um, and on the other hand, uh, there is a, a secondary um, objective in terms of this hearts and minds approach, which is so. We want, or governments want, not only to improve uh, the support from the population uh, in terms of the, 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 the government, but also uh, in terms of discouraging potential uh, insurgents. Uh, and if we think in a model where uh, potential, so future uh, fighters and future uh, terrorists are going to be recruited from the, the local uh, community. Um, so, there is this dual aspect of or this possibility of hearts and minds, not only to decrease um, the, the, the cost of people in terms of joining conflicts, but also to try and change attitudes that uh, potential insurgents have uh, in terms of, of the government. And there's some interesting studies that look at this and that show us that um, in, some, in some areas, especially in the Middle East, um, the, the, the average um, uh, insurgent uh, is not uh, someone without a job and with a low level of education, it's actually the opposite. Uh, so we are talking about people that have uh, good jobs, they have relatively uh, stable income, and they have uh, a, an education level uh, higher than, than the average. So here, the idea of these types of hearts and minds interventions is actually to try and change attitudes. So underlying this, we think that, okay, so there's something else in terms of like being uh, unhappy with their economic status. Uh, so it's not about the material gain for, for some people, it is about their attitudes or their beliefs that they are doing the right thing. Uh, by joining conflict. And this is something that we also have to, to keep in mind when we are designing these types of hearts and minds uh, types of, uh, of interventions and uh, to have some specific types of interventions that actually try to address this. Let me see how am I in terms of time, okay? Um, so this is the overall picture that I want to, to, to bring to you guys and then to tell you that uh, what I want to to talk a little bit more in detail in the rest 10 minutes that I have uh, is to tell you a bit about uh, the work that we've been doing that exactly tries to uh, take what we learn from these uh, interventions in, in, in other countries and see what can be done for a specific case uh, of the rising in, in, in conflict in Northern uh, Okay, um, so, so, so that's so that's it. Uh, so what first, who is us? So us is uh, North Africa and a group of uh, researchers from, from different um, universities. And uh, so why Cabo Delgado? Uh, so recently it, it, there's been a lot of news uh, about, about the area. So I, I probably don't have to go into much uh, detail, uh, but uh, just to give a, a brief overview. So uh, Cabo Delgado is the Northern uh, uh, province in, in, in Mozambique. Uh, it uh, borders uh, Tanzania in the North. It's one of the poorest provinces in the country. And uh, the conflict that recently has been in the news, it started actually in the end of the 2017, uh, with uh, some um, um, police stations and banks are being targeted uh, in Musimbona Praia, which is a northern uh, 
village by, by the sea. And it was initially uh, an official link with extremism. So more recently, this link was, um, let's put it, it, it was a little bit more official when um, uh, in 2019, ISIS uh, broadcasted a link with, with the group or some uh, of, of the groups of people uh, causing uh, disturbances there. So right now, um, estimates uh, tell us that around 2,000 of people uh, dies. And there's more than uh, 600,000 of internally displaced uh, people. And this is without counting with people that fled from, from Palma uh, last week, okay? Um, so, and what type of interventions are, are am I going to, to tell you about and what have we been doing? So we've been working in the province since 2016. So since before the conflict started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that we've done in, in, the, in the province that was about management of natural resources. Uh, but uh, then since the, the beginning of the conflict, we were able uh, to look at the effects of this, this type of intervention uh, in terms of uh, um, violent events. Okay, uh, after the, the beginning of the of the of the conflict in 2017 and 2018 and afterwards, um, and then I'm going to tell you also a little about uh, two interventions that we studied in, the, in 2018 uh, in terms of. Um, Intervention. So one that was uh, mostly a religious intervention uh, done by uh, moderate uh, Islamic leaders uh, in the province, uh, where they uh, discussed uh, a moderate view of the Islam, and uh, we tested how these type of interventions have uh, benefits or, or cons uh, when we consider a professional training, which is more uh, of um, this. Okay, these uh, material benefits and material guns type of intervention that I told you uh, before. And then if I have time, I will tell you a little bit about what we've been doing more recently. Um, but let's see, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if you, I will have time, but then you can ask me in the, in the Q&A if you want to. Uh, hear more about this, but recently we've been looking, we've been working with other uh, religious leaders and passing messages of uh, of peace uh, through uh, community radios, and we are preparing uh, a, a different pro-social interventions in high school students now that uh, a school will well be started uh, again. So that's the idea. Let me briefly tell you about uh, the first project on the natural resources. So this project was actually designed in order to um, address the political resource curse, which is this idea that after the discovery of natural resources, uh, if we have a low quality of, uh, of, of political institutions, then we might end up worse in terms of growth than we started with. And uh, Mozambique is actually a good, uh, a good uh, place where to, to study this. So this intervention was a mix of different uh, NGOs that went to the communities in Cabo Delgado and told people, informed people about um, the timeline and the details of the discovery, but also in terms of the legal rights and, and um, of the communities. Um, and the idea here is that in some areas we, uh, we, we did this intervention with the community, which is more expensive and harder to do. And in others, uh, we did this intervention with only the village leader, which is much cheaper, but of course um, can, uh, can bring uh, some, some, some issues if this information then is not passed through to through the community. So why should this type of intervention work in terms of fighting conflict? Um, so, there, there's different theories why, why could this work. Uh, so one is that uh, communities, when they are informed and they know what's going on, uh, they will uh, be more aware uh, what's about what's happening and they are more united. So there's more social cohesion between uh, members of the community. So they are well equipped to, to, to deal with uh, outsiders and people coming and spreading these weird or these, uh, um, these dissident messages. Um, also, because since uh, communities know what's uh, this positive windfall that is to come, uh, they will be they, sh they should be more um, unwilling to join conflict because uh, since they know that some some share of this uh, money should be uh, for them, uh, this is actually increasing uh, the cost of joining conflict and losing this this windfall. Um, and and finally, so the 
there could also be this uh, mobilization uh, against violence that we've seen in different uh, countries like Nigeria, where actually the fact that communities know about what is going on and they are more uh, aware, uh, they are actually um, more, um, they are actually against uh, more, more people that uh, come with, uh, with dissident uh, messages. So uh, very briefly, so we've done this study in uh, 206 villages in, in Cabo Delgado. So this was an RCT that Matilda actually explained uh, in the beginning. Uh, and the idea here, so this is a large, uh, a large uh, campaign uh, in some areas, uh, all the community was uh, was informed these large uh, community meetings and in others only the, the village leader was informed um so what what do we find very quickly so we find that um there seems to be a positive effect in terms of uh, less conflict in areas where all the community was informed and we observed these with administrative data uh, on conflict uh, in 2017 and in 2018. So it seems that actually this seems to be a cheap way uh, to um, to prevent this, uh, this the, the conflict that started afterwards. And it also had a lot of other uh, positive effects in terms of uh, mobilization of the community, also in terms of demand for accountability uh, of local leaders. Um, so overall, this seems like uh, to be something that works. And the second project that I want to tell you about, uh, it's a project that, uh, so this started after the beginning of the conflict. So this project happened only in Pemba, uh, the capital of the province, uh, untouched by, by, by the conflict until now. Um, and the idea here is to, um, to, to invite a young uh, mouse uh, from, from the local mosques uh, two different types of trainings. In one training, we are testing this uh, moderate view of Islam, where basically religious leaders are using the Al-Quran and, um, and, and the religious um, uh, messages uh, to deconstruct the arguments that are being used in the, in the bush by, by, the, by the extremists uh, in order to say like, you know, like this is a, a religious uh, fights and you should uh, follow. So that's the idea. And the objective here is to use, um, to, to take away this religious belief from, uh, from the support for violence. And we compare this type of interventions with an intervention uh, that is more in terms of money, on, on, um, on, in terms of uh, uh, gains and a future uh, income. Uh, and the idea here is to increase uh, the probability of young males uh, to uh, get a job and start a business with a, with a entrepreneurship and employability skills. So, um, so this was done in, 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 the, in, in Pemba, as I was saying, and in terms of how to measure, so what we were looking in terms of effects. So here we couldn't see how these people then would afterwards go and, and, and join conflict or join uh, the rebel groups, uh, because well, we couldn't ask them, right? So, well, we could, but no one would uh, tell us uh, the truth. Uh, so we, we, we looked at uh, the results by measuring antisocial behavior uh, with a lab time. Um, so I don't have time to explain it to you, but the idea here is to, is to, to use um, a, a simple game in order to see how people are willing to, um, to, to punish other people. So that's, that's the idea. And what we see is that, and I will preview the results uh, here, what we see is that uh, young men that went to the religious um, uh, training are actually um, um, showing less antisocial behavior when we, when we compare it with the control group, while in the employability training, this effect uh, is not shown, or at least it's not statistically significant. So what, what does this show us is that uh, clearly the religious training has an effect in terms of reducing antisocial behavior, and especially when we look at antisocial behavior towards foreigners, um, when compared with the control group, but this employability training, so this story in terms of um, the costs uh, of joining conflict, it seems to not be um, having any effect. So this uh, study actually shows us a little bit. So if we look at what I was telling you before, uh, that it seems that um, these attitudes uh, of, of people are very important and their beliefs about why they should be doing something seems to be 
very, very important compared with an alternative uh, in terms of uh, monetary income. Okay, so that's it. I think I'm, I should stop now, right? Yeah. Um, Thank you so yes, much, Inish. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we'll, if you have any questions, uh, you can, Inez will be here for the, for the Q&A, so, so you'll have time to also ask more details about, about what Inez just presented. Uh, but for now, I would ask uh, Professor Elise Macam to, to maybe uh, start, his, start his intervention. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's not easy to address the issues that you want me to address, especially uh, everything that's got to do with COVID-19. Although we can draw from incredibly sophisticated scientific knowledge, methods and uh, technological artifacts, um, there's still too much uncertainty underlying our understanding. The significant uncertainty bears on what we have so far seen happening in Africa, namely not much. The countries that have paid much of this uh, pandemic's brunt are those who would rank as the most unlikely ones if we consider such criteria as level of development, institutional capacity, financial resources, and health infrastructure. So while we should not underestimate the role of lack of precise knowledge uh, may play in this. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of the low level of testing in most African countries. It is still quite striking that the horror scenarios of bodies piling up on the sidewalks in African cities have not basically materialized. Uh, last year, the German magazine, uh, Der Stern, uh, run the headline, Mysterious Africa, why the continent has so few corona deaths. And the Stern is not the only magazine or newspaper that is so baffled. Uh, it has almost become, you know, like an industry to ask why Africans resist the international disaster rule that says Africa should produce the horror scenario. Uh, when I, as an African, uh, read that Africans are resisting these rules uh, for the first time, well, when I read that for the first time, I was relieved. Uh, then came a period of pride that we might be uh, made from a different, more robust fabric that makes us more resistant, perhaps. But as the questioning went on and on, and given the devastating situation in Europe and America, I began to wonder whether it would not be appropriate to start to apologize to all those who are bearing uh, the brand. Now, behind the perception of what is not happening in Africa lies the normalization of the unfair distribution of positive and negative consequences of global phenomena. Africa takes the place of the continent that comes last among the positives and first among the negatives. People always assume that global problems are similar for all countries, and therefore that all countries depend on similar solutions for their rescue. The devastation uh, COVID-19 has caused in Europe so far is too severe to dismiss as just another pandemic. However, the idea that African countries must respond to this challenge in the same way as Europeans, uh, European countries is quite strange. And this is where I would like to situate my answer concerning the threats to democracy in Africa. Europe's response to the pandemic seems to be a fair description of how democracy works in these countries. The workings of democracy have much to do with uh, entrenched notions of accountability. And there's no value judgment in what I am seeing. I'm not claiming that Europe has superior ways of addressing crisis. All I'm saying is uh, that how Europe addresses crisis reflects how the political system works in Europe. By the same token, how African countries respond to crisis reflects how political systems work in Africa. Again, no value judgment. 
And my point is that COVID-19 represents much more of a threat to democracy in Europe uh, than it does in Africa. And the reason for this is simple. An effective response requires emergency measures and powers that are legitimate from the point of view of accountability, unless your country's name is Sweden. Uh, and it would be generally irresponsible not to be seen to be taking harsh measures. Now, this may foster the tyranny of experts on the one hand, uh, who grow increasingly impatient with those who would like to preserve their freedom, while on the other hand, fueling dissatisfaction with and disaffection from authority on the other hand. Now in Africa, the way governments generally respond to crisis does not attend to accountability in the way we broadly understand the concept. Partly this is due to the blurred boundaries of politics in these settings and a much stronger normative discourse that has been nurtured for years, both locally and externally. And this normative discourse gives governments in Africa the privilege to act on behalf of what is held to be good, irrespective of the process by which such action comes about. And the underlying logic is one of sanctioning as good uh, everything that ends well. And under these circumstances, the responses we see, they fit into a broader and familiar pattern that does not undermine democracy, but rather confirms how the political system works in most African countries. So usually when people talk about threats to democracy, they mean the potential for the limitation of individual rights which cannot be used to countervail the enormous powers governments acquire. But this only applies where accountability drives political decision-making. Where this is not the case, you have business as usual. So governments will theoretically claim more power and individuals will continue to ignore them as best as they can. It's a win-win or perhaps even a lose-lose situation. So if one looks at how African countries have reacted to COVID-19, one sees this pattern. A reasonable response to any crisis always draws from local understandings of what a crisis is. Uh, and confronting a crisis, I think, is a function of local concepts of risk. Risks themselves are translations of dangers or hazards into policy. And for this to be done successfully, decision makers rely on the political system. Ideally, you translate hazards into risks to protect livelihood the best way you can based on the value you attach to human life or property. From a systemic perspective, it is possible to approach political systems as risk producing machines where ideal outcomes balance potential benefit, beneficial effects with negative ones. Now, the fear that a rapid inf infection rate could overwhelm the health infrastructure played an essential role in the translation of the hazard of COVID-19 into a risk in European societies. And this entailed um, taking decisions that required individuals to forego certain rights and certain freedoms. However, these decisions were not taken lightly. They remained contentions throughout. And this is because of the role of accountability I mentioned earlier on. Now, Africans unthinkingly uh, copied and pasted the European response. And in so doing, they seem to have ignored their own notions of risk while at the same time remaining true to how their political systems work. Now, while African countries should take the urgency of a response seriously, there's no reason why Africans should do the same as Europeans. And the choice in Africa is not to let people die or save the economy. The option is to let many people die while maintaining the necessary economic and social infra infrastructure, or letting many people die while not maintaining essential economic and social infrastructure. And one wishes the choice were different, but this is the state of a continent. 
um, that finds itself in the kind of situation Africa is. There's almost a post-colonial irony about how African countries react to COVID-19. They buy into a crisis narrative that conceals that their normal state is a state of crisis, not normality. And yet Africa seems to enjoy uh, the protection of poverty. Uh, the pandemic has revealed uh, the vulnerability of the strong, for example, uh, their heavy dependence on medical infrastructure and the legitimate expectations of the elderly in Europe that this infrastructure will meet their needs. So Africans have always responded to crisis by appealing to their living social safety nets for protection and for action. And this is not a romantic view of the continent. It's just a pragmatic recognition of the continent's present condition, one to which Africans have responded in a resilient manner, albeit at a tremendous uh, human cost. So lockdowns, they weaken, at least in theory, these safety nets by depriving people of both their livelihoods and their opportunities for bonding. In an accountable political system, a response to a crisis would not have undermined that which requires protection. So if you can bear with me, I uh, would like to digress a bit into my work on disasters to give you a sense of what is politically at stake in the argument I'm presenting to you. In the year 2000, there were terrible floods in the Lepopo Valley in Mozambique. They had a massive impact on international public opinion, not least because of the famous uh, Rosita uh, lady, the li little girl uh, who was born in a tree and uh, whose mother was saved just in time. A year later and for the next four years, I researched in a village called Patrice Lumumba, where many of the people who lived in the areas affected by the floods were relocated. And one detail of that research that I would like to share with you has to do with something that several of uh, my informants uh, told me. They told me about people who had been rescued several times by helicopters and boats. And I've spoken to some of these people. People were rescued throughout the day with some of their possessions. Uh, at dawn, some of those people would swim back to their places of origin to retrieve part of their belonging. They would wave to the helicopters and boats, get rescued and come back again the next day. And when they arrived in the village, they would also get new stuff, plastic uh, furniture, pottery, cutlery, and so on. Many died in that attempt to return to their places of origin. Um, and the reason why I share this story with you uh, is that it tells us something important about the social nature of a disaster, but also about the morphology of the social. And finally, about what it means to deal with a disaster. These three issues bear directly on politics. Uh, uh, how politics come into play and what uh, it means to say that a crisis undermines democracy. While I hate discussing Africa as a place lacking in certain essential qualities, I think it is fair to argue that politically there's a disjunction between society and the state such that these are spheres of action which operate on drastically different logics. So one way to clarify this is to say that uh, successful modern political systems are those that are able to conflate the operational logic of society and the state into a coherent whole. Now, su successful modern political systems do not have to be liberal democracies. The only criterion I use is the monopoly over the means of uh, violence. So, in social science, it is a truism to say that natural disasters do not exist. Uh, this, is, this essentially means that the negative effects of a natural occurrence, such as uh, flooding, 
uh, they tend to manifest themselves most strongly among uh, those people who are structurally disadvantaged uh, in society. And the technical term we use to describe this is vulnerability, which uh, represents the political, the cultural, and the economic processes that determine that certain people occupy certain places in the social structure. For example, in the case of the floods, uh, uh, those most affected uh, in the village where I did my research were those who had built in low-lying areas. And many of them were refugees from the war who had not found another place to build their houses. So saying that natural disasters do not exist is also a way of saying that the study of such phenomena refers us um, less to the phenomenon itself and more to the whole set of social circumstances through which uh, the phenomenon manifests itself. This implies accepting the idea that the phenomena may be evaluated in different ways. For example, one of the findings I made uh, was that floods are not necessarily a problem. Another thing that people often said was floods are like a guest. Uh, they come and they stay for three or four days and then they go away. So people associate that idea with another, that the harvest that comes after the flood is invariably good. They acknowledge that people died during the floods, but the death itself was not necessarily the main criterion of moral evaluation of the floods. Incidentally, uh, this is an idea which I explored further with a comparative study in Germany in the Frankfurt Oder Valley and in the US in the Tennessee Valley where my colleagues and I found um, you know, much proximity in flood assessment between Mozambique and the US. In these two countries, the absence of a solid commitment to the idea that what happens to one individual is the outcome of bad decisions taken by a collective body responsible for the well-being of all others increased the level of tolerance of damage. By contrast, in Germany, where only one death was enough reason for people to think that the government was failing in its primary responsibility. People showed much more anxiety about less devastating floods than those one had in Mozambique or in the US. However, the most exciting thing was the belief that the 2000 floods were a disaster in retrospect. And I need to explain this a bit. The presence of the water, the destruction of property, and the deaths were seen as part of what is expected during floods. The problem was that afterwards, and contrary to all the accumulated experience of dealing with floods, the land, the soil hardened, it lost fertility, and did not have a, you know, people didn't have a good harvest. Um, so an accountable political system would have activated an internal discussion process, calling decision makers into account and asking for certain corrections um, to be made into the political system. All this has to do with what I would like to call, if you like, the morphology of uh, politics, whose main characteristic is, uh, well, the fact that um, they are basically uh, plastic. The plastic quality uh, of politics resides in its capacity to assume new forms due to the influences it undergoes over time and space while evading, uh, if you like, causal reduction, uh, something that an accountable political system is expert at doing. Now, one might call this resilience, but it is not the same for the sense in which the social adapts uh, potentially implies also uh, the disappearance of politics. So for example, floods have destroyed communities, but those who have survived have managed to reinvent themselves. We even know in Mozambique that there are flood victim communities. 
groups of people who know where and when there will be floods. They go there, they are affected, and then they get support from international agencies. And this is uh, recurrent in the Zambezi Valley. In fact, from this perspective, uh, the country itself as a whole uh, is, uh, uh, is an expert uh, in doing uh, this. What increasingly defines Mozambique as a country is its capacity to live by exploiting its condition as a victim of something, whatever. For example, now we are victims of international terrorism. So we gain a sense of identity from that. So what I'm saying is this, uh, one of the most significant challenges uh, in the studies of politics uh, is uh, really the sheer determination of the object. Uh, the phenomena itself is less relevant than its morphological aspects. So, uh, you know, as students of politics, uh, our real object is perhaps uncertainty rather than, you know, politics itself. So during my research in the Limpopo Valley, that was uh, the significant discovery that I made. It led me to conclude that what is essential in the local response to floods was not precisely to develop technical means to deal with such phenomena, but to create the conditions for action, no matter how. Uh, so, um, you know, the idea uh, that we act in order to be able to act. And that is how we deal with certainty in our everyday lives. And that is one of the major uh, functions of politics. So this brings me uh, to uh, the third and final point that I would like to make. Uh, so irrespective of the question, uh, which uh, seems uh, challenging to address of whether or not, uh, say the government of uh, Mozambique or of uh, Malawi or Senegal uh, should have, uh, you know, developed better responses uh, to COVID-19. Uh, what we learn uh, is that rather than protecting people or providing means uh, for treatment, the most effective uh, response from a risk management perspective is to create the conditions for people to act. It is not what we need. Uh, it's not what we uh, need uh, the study of politics uh, for, but these are the kinds of questions that uh, I think we need to, uh, to ask. Uh, and it's probably a, a simple matter of management, because if you want to achieve a particular objective, it is not enough to outline the activities that will accomplish that objective. You also have to create the conditions for those activities to be effective. But creating conditions is a function of an accountable political system, not of a political system largely unable to integrate society's logic into the way it functions. And this is what people should have in mind when they talk of the African state apparatus as uh, an alien institution. They are not alien because the state is a modern European concept. They are alien because they have not absorb this societal logic into their functioning. And so this brings me back to my argument about why I don't think we should approach COVID-19 from the perspective of something that poses a threat to democracy in Africa. And there are basically three ideas I want to put forward uh, very briefly. And uh, with that, I will come to an end. The first one concerns the social dynamics from which political action presents itself. Uh, the measures of uh, confinement or of lockdown uh, have been perceived very differently by people in many countries in Africa. Some people follow the measures to the latter, uh, others not so much, and several others much less. And this justified the arrival on the scene, as it were, of law enforcement agents uh, to enforce compliance, which produced other types of behavior. So when political action is essentially unpredictable, like it is in Africa, this is a fair indication that the political system has not been able to translate societal logic into standardized practices. 
The second idea is that societies function as complex systems. It may be possible to create this system, but it is virtually impossible to control its functioning and to predict its outcomes. In the case of African societies, this is made worse by institutional weakness itself. Institutional intervention tends to worsen the problem since uh, all system elements react by creating subsystems that evade institutional control. So in pandemic control, the lesson learned is that the response can never presuppose a level of control over factors that a state does not have. So state intervention actually ends up creating problems. And finally, um, you know, uh, political systems are not able to control outcomes. Measures elicited responses from the people and from the communities. And these responses have potentially uh, and actually produced new social balances uh, that are opaque to institutional intervention and to the individuals themselves. The capacity to manage these unused social balances at the level of the political system will, I think in my view, determine whether the COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to elicit responses likely to undermine democracy. My hunch, uh, and that's my last word, my hunch, uh, and, and this is a, a curious conclusion I'm drawing, is that to the extent that the pandemic has required responses that get to the heart of people's existential condition, it might actually have the beneficial long-term effect of producing a new political culture based on accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your intervention. It was great to it was great to hear your perspective here. Um, I will ask uh, uh, Professor Zefrancisco to to move on to to his intervention on multilateralism and, and international relations. Yes, um, I hope you are already seeing my PowerPoint. Uh, I just share with you. Is it visible? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, congratulate you for this initiative. It's a very important uh, initiative, and uh, I will thank again for inviting me for this uh, for this uh, conference. Also, I would like to compliment my other two uh, colleagues of uh, of this panel, and of course the the the, the audience that uh, is uh, is uh, seeing us. Uh, my point today is, uh, as you can see there in the title, between a rock and a hard place, Guinea-Bissau, CPLP, and ECOWAS. So I will discuss and uh, try to uh, talk a little bit on, uh, um, uh, on Guinea-Bissau, a state actor, and uh, two multilateral organizations, uh, which are the ECOWAS, uh, the regional organization uh, of um, the <clears throat> West African states, and also the CPLP, the community of Portuguese speaking countries uh, um, that uh, has uh, right now nine members, as you know, uh, six of them are from, uh, from Africa. So Guinea-Bissau is a former Portuguese colony in Western Africa, and that it has been the scene of permanent political military instability since uh, its independence. Um, on the other way, in the sub-region, ECOWAS, its original organization, is made up mainly of French-speaking states, some English-speaking, and two Portuguese-speaking countries, which are, as you know, Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau. Uh, in 1996, uh, the CPLP, the Community of Portuguese-speaking Countries, was uh, established, as you know, um, uh, and uh, uh, today it has nine members, um, Portugal, Brazil, uh, East Timor, and uh, uh, the six African countries, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, Guinea-Bissau. So uh, I will try to um, discuss this point, which I think uh, uh, will reflect the main and the general topic that I, uh, I want to talk about. Um, 
the 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 influence that uh, some state actors have in the multilateral organizations especially in these two that i will talk about uh, right now and uh, the um, the instrumentalization that sometimes uh, state actors uh, especially former colonial powers like uh, portugal and uh, mostly uh, france uh, will uh, make of this of these uh, multilateral uh, organizations. Uh, so, uh, in the political military conflict that plagued Guinea Bissau in 1998-1999, the two international organizations, these two that I just mentioned, they became involved in a dispute over influence over the mediation of the conflict. It is common voice that apparently there was a political dispute between these organizations, one representing the interests of the Francophonie, uh, ECOWAS, and the other the interests of the Lusophonie, the CPLP. This rivalry was repeated recently, now with less drama, of course, in the elections uh, that gave victory to the current president, Umaro uh, Sissoko Mbalo, against the PAGC candidate Domingos Simões Pereira. The latter would deserve the support of the CPLP, of the Portuguese community, while the former had the support of ECOWAS. Um, once again, the interests of Lusophonie against the interests of uh, Francophonie would be present in this situation. And Guinea-Bissau is in the middle of those interests. So as you can see there, uh, Guinea-Bissau, it's uh, one of these countries in uh, Western Africa. It's surrounded uh, by two Francophone countries, uh, namely Senegal and uh, 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 Guinea-Conakry. Uh, so it's in the middle of what is also uh, supposed to be a, a zone, uh, uh, an African uh, area. Uh, which has the uh, influence of the uh, former colonial power, uh, France. Uh, the ECOWAS, as you can see there, um, is constituted uh, of these countries, as you can see. So mainly they are French-speaking countries, but also English-speaking countries. And as I mentioned before, two uh, Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, Guinea-Bissau and uh, Cape Verde. And then the CPLP, this more recent organization, um, that today has nine members, as I just mentioned also. So Portugal and France have used their influence and leverage in the two multilateral organizations, CPLP and ECOWAS, in order to pursue their geopolitical and cultural interests in Guinea-Bissau. The support of Portugal and CPLP to Asuman Mané, Asuman Mané was the rebel leader uh, in that conflict in 1998-1999, was in clear opposition to the support of Senegal and Guinea-Conakry, two French-speaking countries um, from ECOAS, to Nino Vieira in the conflict that I just mentioned. Nino Vieira was the then president of Guinea-Bissau. Uh, France was also behind its former colonies, uh, uh, Senegal and Guinea-Conakry, in an attempt to attract Guinea-Bissau to its area of interests. During that period, and also beyond, the two multilateral organizations have been instrumental uh, uh, in the geopolitical gangs of the two former uh, colonial powers. Portugal during those days, I say again, it was in 1998-1999, sent a task force, a military task force, led by the Corte Real Fregate to Guinea-Bissau waters, um, with the excuse of uh, uh, coming, of uh, bringing back the Portuguese community, or at least some of them who were there in danger in Guinea, in, uh, in Bissau. But that uh, frigate uh, was also the place of a ceasefire uh, between the two main parties uh, in conflict in Guinea Bissau. Uh, that ceasefire was signed in that frigate in 1998, and CPLP was the main mediator. So as you can see here, uh, this was on board of the uh, Portuguese frigate, uh, uh, and those two are uh, the two uh, representatives of the two opposite sides in the civil war in uh, Guinea-Bissau. So this was uh, uh, seen as a okay victory of the Portuguese diplomacy over the interests of the Francophonie 
in that region during those days. Uh, but in 1999, when some months uh, later, uh, an uprising in Bissau led by a Suman Mané, uh, military and civil supporters that were not uh, very happy with the, 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 the agreements that were established one year uh, before, uh, they rise against the Ninuvier government, and that resulted in the destruction of the French Cultural Center, where the embassy of the, the French embassy was also functioning, and the consequent escape of the French diplomats and the small garrison of special forces, French legionaries that were protecting the French interests. All of them asked protection to the Portuguese embassy. They were later on evacuated by a Portuguese military plane, and the then French foreign minister, Hubert Védrine, found uh, his counterpart, the Portuguese foreign minister, Jean Gama, expressing his gratitude. So all these events uh, were considered during those days as a victory to the Portuguese diplomacy over the interests of France. But, however, coincidentally or not, after this humiliation for the French, Ansuman Mané was assassinated one year later in Gambia. Nino Vieira was also assassinated years later. Portugal and France, CPL, CPLP and ECOWAS, have chosen right now, okay, we are talking now we jump in, in, in time, and though we came back from 1998 uh, to 2019, so right now, if, uh, last year, they have chosen to support again different candidates in the last elections of December 2019. Domingo Simões Pereira, by the way, he was a former uh, uh, executive secretary of CPLP, was supported by Portugal and of course CPLP, and he lost the election, as you know, and Umaro uh, Sissoko Ambalo, supported by ECOWAS, as one. So this is al almost like a, a, a kind of a revenge of the French interests. Now they have uh, this uh, uh, victory in diplomacy, if you want. But in the end of the day, Guinea-Bissau continues to be one of the poor nations in the world. So this is the sad conclusion that we uh, came over after uh, this brief description of what is happening uh, in, that, in that place of the world. So to conclude, and I intended to be very brief <laughs> because the time is going on, uh, uh, to conclude, uh, some multilateral organizations are uh, instrumentalized by uh, uh, powerful, powerful actors or not so powerful as it was the case of Portugal uh, and CPLP, uh, but France, of course, uh, 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 sometimes uh, use uh, these uh, multilateral actors to pursue their own interests, uh, namely uh, geopolitical interests or cultural interests or even economic uh, interests. So uh, um, things se uh, seem to change, but uh, in the end of the day, uh, they continue uh, as it, uh, they were before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for for your for your intervention here. Uh, I would like now to uh, open um, our uh, for for our discussion. Uh, so please, if you have uh, questions, uh, feel free to write them uh, here in the in the chat. Uh, so Professor Jose Francisco, he will have to to leave uh, this uh, this talk a little bit early because he has a, a class to teach. Uh, so if you have uh, questions for, for him uh, first, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, maybe I'll start with one myself um, while we wait for, for uh, participants here to, to jump in, uh, which is, so, so you mentioned that uh, here in your intervention that basically uh, in the end, there were these two interests that were, that are still playing in, in, in Guinea-Bissau and um, but that for Guinea-Bissau specifically, nothing really, nothing really has changed. As you said, it's it's still one of the poorest nations. Uh, it's still a, a very poor country. Um, so my question here is, what can be done? What can be done so that uh, this very strong or not so strong powers um, 
can do something in prol of 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 this uh, of these countries. Yes, good question. Uh, well, uh, we can use uh, 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 my colleague Inej's solution, for instance, uh, <laughs> to to try to 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 do that in Guinea-Bissau also. So, um, as you know, uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, uh, was also uh, uh, known for being uh, an international hub for drug trafficking. Trafficking also. So there is lots of problems down there due to the lack of state uh, uh, to these uh, uh, um, rivalries between uh, factions in the country. And also one of the main reasons for this instability is because uh, the military there have the tendency to intervene in the political sphere. If you if you consider this, uh, imagine uh, and try to make a, a contrast between Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. They are two former Portuguese colonies. One is very su successful. Cape Verde is one of the most successful countries in Africa. If you look at uh, the international rankings, uh, you will see that Cape Verde is always on the top of good governance and things like that. And on the opposite, you see Guinea-Bissau uh, on the other side of, of, of the rankings. So one of one question that is very, very, very important question that we should ask in political science and also in other social sciences is why? Why, if they have a similar uh, past, a similar colonial past, they were both Portuguese colonies, um, they were independent in the same year, in 1975, as you know. Uh, so why these differences? Why one is so successful and why the other one is not so successful? So if you could consider and try to answer this question, maybe uh, you can find a solution, you know? Uh, I have some answers. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, maybe one of the main reasons it's because Cape Verde uh, is considered one of the few nation states in Africa, okay? So they are cultural homogeneous, okay? Uh, there is no ethnic differences in Cape Verde. While in Guinea-Bissau, you have, uh, all of these uh, ethnic uh, grievances and differences. And uh, that is one of the main aspects that we should consider uh, when we look at the, how things uh, uh, happen in Guinea-Bissau. So that is one part of the answer. Of course, the answer is much more complex, but uh, maybe this is the start of, uh, uh, of that answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I um, I don't see here um, any questions from from our participants. So maybe I will follow with with just one more, which is um, uh, still for uh, to, to Professor Jose Francisco, which is um, basically we have seen that uh, now speaking a little bit uh, about Mozambique, uh, we have seen. Oh, we have here maybe a question. Okay, so let me see here. Um, so uh, we have here Tomas that is asking if uh, you think that it's possible to have foreign interventions uh, in Africa that don't have geopolitical interests uh, associated uh, with them. Well, I think it's difficult really. Uh, if we look at the examples in the past, uh, we will see that uh, that is very difficult. Just, just to mention you were talking about Mozambique, uh, just to see what's going on down there right now. Who is the country that uh, uh, offers the military support for the Mozambican armed forces? Portugal. Portugal is sending 60 uh, training officers to, to that country. So why? Why Portugal? Of course, the answer is obvious. There are cultural, historic, linguistic, uh, geopolitical interests or whatever. Uh, but of course, there are always uh, interests in these kinds of operations. So uh, I don't think that uh, countries just go to, 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 to these areas of conflict uh, just for uh, the interest of doing good or something uh, uh, altruistic like that. I mean, uh, <laughs> international relations is, is full of interests, as you know. So um, sorry to say, but uh, I'm very uh, realistic when I try to understand what's going on there. And I cannot see any uh, intervention, uh, whether military or not, 
uh, where don't you where you don't have any kind of interest so it seems it seems like it's a a, a complicated thing to to achieve right yeah, yeah of course uh, we have here also a question uh, asking about the differences between the African Union model of regionalism and uh, the the difference uh, at comparing to to its different uh, difference with the European Union. So the differences in region, uh, the regionalism between the African Union and and the European Union. Well, there is a lot uh, lots <laughs> of uh, African regional organizations, as you know. I just mentioned one, ECOWAS. Yeah. Uh, the other one is SADC, for instance, in the Southern Africa, where Mozambique is part of. Those are the two most successful uh, regional organizations in Africa. But then you have also this uh, uh, project of uh, constituting a uh, continental, uh, um, uh, a continental uh, regional uh, organization. Like the, the African Union is also on, on that path. Uh, so African Union is trying to replicate in Africa what we have done here in Europe. Um, they try to establish the uh, continental free trade area, for instance, uh, and they will go from there uh, to more advanced uh, forms of integration. But uh, it's a long way to go, really. Um, I think maybe, I don't know if Professor Elise would also like to, to weigh in of, on, on this question. <laughs> And uh, Professor I, uh, José Francisco, I know you have to leave at some point, so... Uh, well, I you... try to answer as much questions as I can, yes. so, but thank you anyway. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sorry, but I have students waiting for me <laughs> in, the, in the next room, which is already here, the team. Yes. <laughs> we understand. It's no problem at all. And thank you again for, for coming and we'll continue the discussion with our, with our two other panelists. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Well, uh, perhaps what I can say to um, the discussion so far is that I think it's always important to take into account uh, how uh, young African nation states are. I mean, we, we, we tend to forget this, uh, but 60 years, historically speaking, is not a long time. And uh, I hate to make these kinds of analogies, but if you, you look back on history in Europe, really the most stable period in European history has been since the end of the Second World War. You know, before that, these, this continent was very unstable. And in some ways, what we see in Africa is a repetition of that. So rather than um, worrying too much about the fact that these things are happening, I mean, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they're happening. We should actually expect them to happen. Uh, and then we shouldn't actually even worry about uh, trying to give an account of those places where these things are not happening. So the outliers like Cape Verde, because they will not help us understand the structural conditions that are at stake here. So we should really try to understand uh, structural factors that have to do uh, with how difficult it may be for a nation state that is constituting itself uh, to constitute itself while at the same time, uh, you know, providing for its people. It's, it's almost like you're trying to build, uh, you're, you're sailing while at the same time you're trying to build the, bo the boat. It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, let me continue here. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, two questions for, so from uh, Daniel Marien uh, for Inés. Uh, so uh, uh, it's asking, so what is the main goal of the pro-social investments with high school students? And uh, how do you look at the lack of international intervention in, in, in Mozambique? Okay, I'm going to mute this. You can hear me. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, about the first question, uh, so, so the idea here um, 
So I, that question was about this uh, fourth study that I briefly mentioned uh, that will start soon. And the idea here is to look at, um, at providing different alternatives of to, to, to people that potentially uh, could become, uh, could join conflicts. Uh, okay, so here the idea here uh, is that uh, we are targeting uh, young males uh, that are still at a very uh, susceptible uh, age and that could join, uh, that could join conflict or, or could uh, indirectly uh, support uh, conflict. And the idea here is that if you have uh, people that are very well integrated in, in a society, uh, they are less likely uh, to, to, to break ties uh, with this society and with this community that they, they feel they belong to, uh, to join an outside group. Okay, so, that, so this is uh, mostly the idea. Uh, so the plan here is to do this in, in different ways uh, with cognitive behavioral therapy um, and other types of interventions. That's uh, the objective here is to strengthen uh, ties to, to, to the community uh, and where this community, at least in Northern Mozambique, it's, it's mostly very moderate and it's mostly very acceptant uh, of uh, other cultures and other religions. Uh, so um, so they, they see these uh, outside uh, messages as something that don't belong to their uh, social norms. So the idea here is a little bit about that. Um, so about the, the second question about the lack of uh, international international intervention uh, in Mozambique. So, so that's a tough one. Um, so I'm not sure if, if the issue here is, um, is about the lack of countries that want to intervene or the lack uh, of, uh, of, of the Mozambican uh, government to want this intervention because, well, here I, I have to, I have to to, to agree uh, with uh, with the previous um, with, with, with the previous professor that I I also believe that no intervention is purely altruistic right and I I would say that the the, the, the Mozambican government it's very likely agrees with that uh, so there's no no altruistic help I, I would say so. Um, it, it's very likely there's a, a price to pay, uh, and uh, there's there's very reasons why 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 a country wouldn't want to, to pay this price. Um, so I'm I'm not sure if if this is a, an issue of countries not wanting to help or not wanting to provide the help that uh, uh, the country needs or the country thinks that needs. Um, so probably there is a mismatch here, um, and. It's, I, I would also say that um, in, in some way this, so this is a relatively old issue right now, but only very recently started to gain uh, international attention, right? So it's, um, so, so if, you, if you follow the news, so uh, the, the, the recent attacks in Palm is something that uh, shocks a lot of people. It was very, oh, I have no idea this was happening. Uh, but that's been happening, well, with, with a lot of intensity, at least for the past two years. So it, it, it's understandable that the country does not want to uh, decide uh, their uh, security strategy based on international opinion. Uh, so it's, well, I, I'm not answering your question because I honestly don't, don't know. Uh, uh, the answer, but this is my a little bit of my my perspective uh, on this. Okay. Um, this was also related to to the question that that Joanna uh, uh, asked uh, right after. Uh, but maybe I don't know if Professor Elisio also wants to weigh in here uh, in this question of of what is happening in in Mozambique right now and the the perspective of of international um of of uh, let's say international help uh in 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 the in northern mozambique right now i can try uh i think it's pretty much uh what uh in hvll is saying uh it's also i think uh you know a serious problem of leadership uh, that mozambique has at the moment uh mozambique does not have strong leadership 
so not strong in the sense of a strong uh, hand, but strong in the sense of uh, someone who understands politics. Um, and uh, there is no uh, institutional framework. So let us say the, the political party, the ruling uh, party. Uh, that uh, functions in a way that is supportive uh, of a weak uh, leader. The party itself institutionally is weak uh, and therefore he's just unable to rise to the occasion. So this is something that uh, we, we, we don't take into account, but for me, it's the major factor uh, behind what's going on in Mozambique uh, right now. So um, he has been very undecisive uh, about whether to ask for assistance abroad. Uh, and, and this is for me, uh, if you like, uh, additional proof uh, that he's uh, just not up to the job, uh, right? And, and then there are all the things that are beyond him that have to do with uh, how the political system works uh, how different interests interact uh, in Mozambique. I mean, so in Cap Delgado, you don't just have uh, the insurgency. I mean, uh, you have the narcotics problem, uh, pretty much like you had uh, in Guinea-Bissau and you have in Mali. Um, and uh, you, you have all the illegal uh, businesses, uh, uh, you know, the illegal trade in uh, uh, precious stones in in uh, timber uh, so the, you know i don't blame the president for not being able to control this this is just you know i don't think there's any president in the world uh, who would do a better job in mozambique uh, right now so you have that as well and that's something that you need to take into account uh, to understand uh, uh, what's going on. So perhaps uh, uh, what I can say in response to Joana Muratu uh, is that conflicts like those you have in Mozambique have a potential uh, to turn anyone who comes as a solution into part of the problem, right? And, and so this is definitely something I would not support uh, it's not that people are unwilling to help. It's not that people have not tried to help other countries in Africa. Uh, look at uh, Mali and how long the French have been there uh, and uh, how unable they have been uh, to help uh, Mali. Look at Libya, uh, look at Somalia, uh, look at, uh, you know, there are so many countries where you have actually had uh, international intervention and it has not uh, uh, you know produced any uh, good uh, outcome so in that sense uh, i think rather than thinking in terms of uh, who could help and why they are not helping through intervention we really need to uh, gain a much better understanding uh, of the underlying problems and the underlying problems are political and in Mozambique, uh, for me, the main problem is the quality of the leadership. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think we are um, we are on time, uh, Beatrice. Uh, we had here uh, we had yes, here yes, an additional question, question, but it was already for uh, Professor Zay, which unfortunately had to leave us a little bit early. Um, so I would like to uh, thank uh, everyone again for, for, for being here today. It was a, a real pleasure. Uh, I hope everybody in the audience had uh, uh, learned as much as I did from, uh, from, from our panelists today. And uh, once again, thank you for, to the panelists and thank you for, to the organization. And um, yeah, we'll uh, hopefully uh, we'll all see the, the session uh, tomorrow still of the, of the conference that is still going to, to continue tomorrow. Okay, thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you once again.